I brought three stones from my beloved Lake Tahoe to remember my three beloved literature muses from school past, Diane Courtois, Beth Lesperance, and Irene May. Diane was a profound teacher, and she was devoted to her students, always working with them to make them better, smarter, wiser. Her husband of 48 years, Jean, described her as a wonderful life partner an intellect, fresh and creative, a great cook and seamstress, a poised professional at school. But after hours, she was down to earth, even salty, and always witty. I remember her for being one of the very first teachers that I knew of to place a peace symbol in the rear view window of her beloved red VW Beetle that she had for almost 20 years. Diane Stone shared with me that she always had books in that car. Books were everywhere, even in the trunk. She was a prolific reader and library junkie, I think, right up to the end of her life. She loved English, journalism, and literature. She left us in 2007, having had a lingering and degenerative spinal disease and COPD brought on by asthma. She left a lasting passion in many of us. And just look what we've done with that gift. And then there's Beth. What a teacher. What a fine lady. She was a real poet. And the most alluring quality she had was her ability and facility with language. She had a real spark for life and adventure. She was my Pied Piper when it came to cultivating a love for English in my life. It has always stayed with me. Beth and Ray were married for 15 years, and they began as students at San Jose State. And if you want to feel old, her twin girls, Jody and Lisa, are now 46. Their dear mother died when they were 19 from brain cancer in 1982. Jim Killian called her a fairy, and Diane Stone called her a hummingbird. She was pretty and intense. She looked like an orphan with big, hungry, expressive eyes that had the ability to always get you to look at her. She had a low, big voice and was so intimate with her students and colleagues. I miss her always. Last but not least is Mrs. May. Irene came to her librarian job at the high school right out of college in her early 20s and she was with the school until she finally retired many years later. She was our Mary and the librarian. Shh, lower your voice. <laughs> and a beloved resource to teachers and students alike. She was always efficient and supportive in all that she did. Jim Killian told me that she never once did not agree to buy a book that he wanted in the library collection. <laughs> she was my father's librarian when he graduated from Piedmont High School in 1946, and she was my mother's boss for many years later in her role as the library assistant on Irene's staff. She, too, was a great and gifted part of the high school experience we have all come to know and remember. So I say to you, good night, Irene, and Beth, and Diane. You were spectacular teachers, just brilliant, and we thank you and honor you today and always. I'd like to speak this evening about my dear friend, Elwood Garretts. 
we were dear friends for 45 years, ever since I glimpsed this marvelous being in my seventh grade geography class. I felt a heart connection with him, a soul connection that endured until his death. He was a complicated person. He came from very poor beginnings in South Dakota. There were not many professions open to a farm boy. He became a teacher like his mother. He came to uh, Piedmont right after World War II and stayed there until his retirement. He really could have been a wonderful architect in a different life because he had wonderful taste and wonderful eye for form and function and he was a restless critic of modern architecture. After the Oakland Hills fire, we would walk through the neighborhood and he would ruthlessly critique houses that have been built to replace the ones that burned. A lot of us here were in his geography class or his English class or his study hall, and I think we can all remember how unconventional he was and that humor that he had. There are a number of us that can still recite Form A. <laughs> I also remember Form B and Form C. Elliot died last year on June 13th. He keeled over in his garden, just like Marlon Brando in The Godfather. And that was the way that he would have liked to have gone, and that's the way he did go, because he was horrified of ever being a burden to anyone. He's also still in his garden because his last request was to be scattered there. A month later, there was a wonderful memorial in his garden with all his, his friends present, and we gave him a great send-off. I remember as a teacher, he was a, a pretty stern disciplinarian. <laughs> but, you know, he remembered incidents for decades that he would recount with great pleasure of things that we had said or done, and he always considered our class the best class that Piedmont ever produced. He said, you guys were the last great class. <laughs> but uh, there's something else. Uh, you know, he was a wonderful host, and, and he was a wonderful fan of the English language. His language was precise. His letters were gracious and, and brilliant, and I saved stacks of them. He loved to travel, he loved to hike, and he loved to walk right up to the end. And, you know, uh, when he died, his death was noted in the evening television news in the Bay Area, but it wasn't because he was a PHS teacher. Even before Stonewall, which happened the month and the year that we graduated, he was a ferocious proponent of gay rights and human rights for all people. And like many people of his generation, he lived double life. He had to keep who he was hidden from certain people and, and aspects of his life. But I know that today, he would like to be remembered for all of who he was. And I honor him for that. I honor him for all that he did for everyone, for social causes, for justice, for human rights, for everyone. He was tireless. He gave everything he had. He was my friend and I miss him.